Welcome back to Public Finance in Canada. I'm Keith Kucha. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at, amongst other things, Pareto efficiency. So where we're going to start off is, of course, taking a look at Pareto efficiency, as that is the title. Uh, but beyond that, just efficiency itself, Pareto improvements, potential Pareto improvements. And of course, we're going to have to define what all that is. From there, in order to be really able to see this in action, we're going to be taking a look at a concept known as utility. For those of you who maybe have a bit of an econ uh, microeconomics background, this is going to be a pretty familiar concept. We'll introduce some difference curves, and then we will wrap up by taking a look at an Edgeworth box. So Edgeworth box is just really a way to compare distributional improvements between two economic agents. So all that being said, let's go jump into things. Let's go take a look at this notion of efficiency and specifically Pareto efficiency. So let's jump over and take a look. Okay, so what we wanna take a look at is this notion of efficiency. Let's uh, write that down there, uh, efficiency. Okay, so with efficiency, what we're really gonna be getting at is, well, let's start off with a bit of an example. Let's take a look at an example here. Let's suppose that uh, we have two people. Let's, uh, let's try to get that a straight line here. We have two people. We have Bill and we have Ted. So, okay, what do we have here? We have, we have Bill on our vertical axes and we'll have Ted on the horizontal. Now, Bill and Ted, they're just having their excellent adventure. And as they're going along, they end up finding, they end up finding $100. And what we want to take a look at is an efficient way, right? Because that's what we're talking about, efficiency, an efficient way in which Bill and Ted could distribute this $100 between themselves. So, okay, taking a look at this, this $100, clearly one way that we could do this is we could go and we could give Bill the entire 100. The alternative, of course, to be the other extreme is that we could give Ted the entire 100. From this, we could then come up with any kind of combination from, hey, 50, 50, 40, 60, 20, 80, on and on and on, such that that full 100 is accounted for. And what we would get is we would get a frontier, a line connecting these two extremes. Now, in this case, any part, any point along this line is going to be an efficient outcome. And it's going to be an efficient outcome because we're fully utilizing the resource available to us. That is, we're fully utilizing this $100. We are not leaving anything behind on the table. We're not just kind of saying, hey, I'll take 40, you take 40, and we'll leave $20 behind for somebody else. No, no, no. We're being efficient. We're fully utilizing it. Nothing is being left unutilized. So, this line, this line represents an efficient point anywhere along it. But okay, what was this? What was this notion that we brought up then of Pareto? Uh, let's use the right tool to actually write here. What about this notion of Pareto efficiency, or at, uh, otherwise we can say a Pareto optimal outcome? Okay, well a Pareto efficient outcome or a Pareto optimal outcome is going to be an outcome that is well, first of all, efficient. So somewhere along this line would be efficient and Pareto optimal would be in such a way that this distribution, this outcome that we have arrived at is such an outcome that there is no way to achieve any other outcome without making somebody else worse off. So that is to say, let's pick a point here. Let's say that we decide to split this and we decide to split it 80 for Bill and 20 for Ted. So, okay, there we go. 80 bucks and 20 bucks. This is an efficient distribution of the money. It's on the line there. And once we've come up with this distribution, it would also be a Pareto optimal outcome in the sense that there's no other way that we could redistribute this money without making one of our agents worse off. That is, right, sure, we have this full line of potential efficient outcomes but if we picked a new point if we picked a new point let's say right there i will say almost i don't know if i got that exactly right but 50 50 uh 50 50 
Well, yes, this outcome, it could also be efficient. But because we already got to our first outcome, there was no way to get from the first outcome to the second outcome without making Bill worse off. So in that sense there, in this example, any outcome that we start off with, wherever we end up as this kind of initial distribution as to how we split the $100 is going to be both an efficient outcome and an Pareto optimal outcome. And the reason that it has to also be a Pareto optimal outcome is that once we arrive there, there's no way to arrive at any other outcome without making either Bill or Ted worse off. This, of course, brings up a really interesting, uh, really interesting conversation, and that is the conversation around efficiency versus fairness. And okay, efficiency versus fairness. As we go through this, we can go and we can point, as we have, anywhere along this red line is an efficient outcome. In this scenario, wherever we wind up, right, wherever we wound up as our initial distribution, that is also going to be a Pareto efficient or a Pareto optimal outcome. And that's going to be the case because, as we've said, a Pareto efficient outcome is one such that you cannot deviate from it without making any one agent worse off. And we see that here. We could not get away from any point along this line once it's distributed without hurting one of them. So efficiency, we can point to it. We can figure out where it is. This here, this is the realm of economics. This is something that as economists, we are very, very concerned about is this notion of efficiency and ensuring that markets and ensuring that everything that's happening within our realm is efficient or at least as efficient as it could be, as close to efficiency as we could achieve. Fairness, on the other hand, well, fairness, not to say that economists are not interested or not uh, caring about fairness. Uh, it is actually a big area of work, but the problem with fairness is that uh, it really depends, right? It really depends. The outcome really is fair for who. For example, if we go back to Bill and Ted, it may be that Bill was the one who initially found the $100, and Bill found it, Bill picked it up, and then just out of the goodness of Bill's heart, Bill gave $20 to Ted. In that case, you might say, actually, that is a fair outcome. Bill found that money and just gave it out of goodness of the heart. If, however, they both found that money and Bill just happened to grab it first, well, maybe you might not think that that is so fair. Maybe you might think that this 50-50 split is more of a fair outcome. So in that sense there, fairness is a bit more difficult to define. Fairness is very much more difficult to determine. As a result, we would say that this fairness, this is more of a political. That's more in the realm of political decision makers. So the role of politics. And so not to say that economics and politics are separated. We'll see very much as we go through this course that they're extremely interrelated. But you'll notice that as we go through economics, the focus will be on efficiency. It is then the policymaker, the political side of thing, that then needs to determine, okay, what is society's view? What does society want? What is social ideas of fairness? And how do we achieve that? Ideally, how do we get to a scenario that is both efficient and fair? And we'll see that that sometimes is achievable, as we see here in this Bill and Ted scenario. Sometimes efficiency and fairness is a trade-off. Sometimes we have to give up efficiency in order to meet social notions of fairness, or sometimes we have to give up fairness in order to reach efficiency. So something we will look at, something we will evaluate as we carry on in this video series. Okay, jumping on though, to continue to really evaluate this idea of Pareto efficiency and to be able to take a look at this idea of a Pareto or a potential Pareto improvement, two other aspects we need to define. Before we can really get there, what we need to look at is first this idea of social welfare. And in order to take a look at social welfare, we have to get an idea of individual welfare. And one way that we measure individual welfare in economics is through this notion of utility. Okay, 
So what is utility? Well, utility is kind of this idea of happiness or satisfaction or joy or usefulness that you get from consuming a good or service. And what we believe as economists is that the more of any one good or service that you consume, you will get more and more and more utility, that is more and more joy, more and more usefulness from it, but you will receive this at a decreasing or a diminishing rate. And let's take a look at an example of this, and then we'll come back, we'll circle around, and we'll talk about some of the features of utility. So let's say that you are hungry, you're walking around downtown, and you want to get some pizza. So, okay, we have your quantity of pizza. Okay. So initially, you have zero slices of pizza. You have no pizza at all. Okay. If you have no pizza, the extra happiness, this extra utility, this extra satisfaction you're getting from your slice is going to be very similarly zero. So I'm going to call this MU. That's going to stand for marginal utility. All we mean by marginal is the incremental change. So what is that incremental change in my happiness, in my utility, in my satisfaction, if I were to change my consumption by an incremental amount? So initially, zero, and well, of course, zero. We would then have our total utility, my total satisfaction, my total joy, all of that said, well, if I'm having no pizza, I'm getting no extra satisfaction from no extra pizza. <laughs> my total utility, my total joy from pizza is, uh, of course, zero. So we get zeros across the board. What happens? What happens is we go and, right, we're walking around downtown, we're hungry, and we go and we get our first slice of pizza. Uh, it kind of looks like a bit of a funny one. Let's just make it our generic kind of line as a one. There we go. Okay, so we have our first slice of pizza. We were hungry, we were starving, we ordered this first slice of pizza, and on a, let's say, a five-point scale, we go, wow, that pizza was amazing, it satisfied my hunger, it tasted perfect, not much more that would be better than that in this moment. I'm going to give it a five out of five for potential satisfaction it could have given me. Well, again, in this case here, this marginal utility, this is the extra utility or the extra satisfaction I get from consuming an extra unit. So, hey, I got plus five utility for eating one slice of pizza. That brings my total utility, my total satisfaction, up to five units of satisfaction as well. Okay, so you've had this first slice of pizza. You're sitting there in the pizza shop. You look over and you go, hmm. Maybe, maybe I can go for a second slice. So you go and you order your second slice of pizza. This second slice of pizza comes, you go and you eat it, and you know what? It was pretty good. But that edge of hunger was already taken off by the first one. It was good, but you're kind of starting to get full now. Altogether, it did not give you as much satisfaction as that first slice did. So we're going to say that, hey, that extra utility that it gave you for that extra slice is only three. That is now altogether your total utility. Well, you obtained five extra from the first slice, three extra from the second slice. You have a total utility now of eight. So we see that, hey, we have this diminishing extra utility. Every extra slice you're buying gives you less and less extra happiness, but your total happiness, that is your total utility, is still growing. To carry on with this example, let's take a look at one more. Right, you go and you're like, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll have a third slice of pizza. So at this point, you go and you buy your third slice of pizza. You were already kind of verging on the point of being extremely full. You have this third slice of pizza. You're now completely stuffed. It still gave you some satisfaction, some happiness, some joy, some usefulness, but not nearly as much. Right at this point, it was almost just gluttony. So it gave you just a tiny bit of extra satisfaction. We'll just say one giving you all together the increase in your total satisfaction, your total happiness as, well, five from the first one, three from the second one, that gave us eight, and then another one from the third one, that's going to give us nine as our measurement of total happiness, total satisfaction, total usefulness from these three slices. And we would expect to witness this for any good or service that we consume, is that if we consumed it within a certain set of time, 
is that, hey, the extra satisfaction I received from an extra slice would tend to decrease depending on your personal preferences, depending on the good or service we're talking about. It may decrease quicker. It may decrease slower. At the same time, although this is decreasing, your total joy, your total satisfaction, your total utility is rising. But we just notice that it's rising at a decreasing rate. Initially, we went plus five, plus three, plus one right? It's still rising, but it's rising at a slower and slower rate as this marginal utility diminishes. Okay, that's the big idea about utility. There's, of course, a lot more we could say about it. There's just a few kind of definitional items that I want to get into, but beyond that, the big takeaway is diminishing marginal utility, increasing total utility, but increasing at that decreasing rate. Some other features of utility are, let's talk about these other definitional features of utility. First one is that it is ordinal. Okay, what exactly does ordinal mean? What does, where does this word come from? What's going on? Well, okay, what this means is that these numbers that we've come up with are, yeah, okay, they're numbers in that sense, but they don't really have meaning in the way that we traditionally think of numbers. And that is all we can really say is that these numbers, when we're talking about utility, all they have is order. And what I mean by that is I can say, yes, five is greater than three and three is greater than one. That's just taking a look at this column here, right? So I can put that order into place and I can say, great, five is more than three, three is more than one. But that's really all I can say. I cannot say that, hey, four is twice as much as two, right? I can't, I can't say that. I can't say that four is twice as much as two because given our ranking system here, all we're doing is ranking. We're just saying that, hey, four is a lot, two is less. How much less? I, I don't know. It's just less. In the same way, if we take a look at our initial ranking here, we kind of went minus two, minus two, which then makes it look like, hey, this is constant. The difference between your first and second slice, that drop in your extra utility was in the same as between your second and your third slice. Again, that's not necessarily true. The numbers don't have meaning in the traditional numerical sense. All they have meaning in is to say that, hey, five is greater than three. Five could be a lot greater than three, and three could be just a little bit bigger than one, or it could be the opposite case. Fact is, we don't know. Fact is, all that we have going on here is that the numbers are ordered. Outside of that, we can't say anything as to their magnitude or their value. Okay, to kind of add to this complexity then is, let's say we had two people. Let's just scroll down a little bit here. Let's say that we had both John and we had Cindy. Both John and Cindy, they get a cookie. And both John and Cindy are asked, hey, on a 10-point scale, how much extra satisfaction did you get from that cookie? And John says, hey, you know what? That cookie, that was a 7 out of 10. And Cindy goes, yeah, you know what? That cookie there, that was a 6 out of 10. Now, it might be, looking at it, it might be like, hey, look at this. John, John got more utility from that cookie. John likes cookies more. John's getting more happiness from cookies than Cindy is. But that's not necessarily true. In fact, we cannot make any kind of relationship between the utility between two different people. That is right. When we're talking about John's case, John might be saying, hey, you know what? This extra cookie was great. I don't really have a high ranking for what happiness is. So, hey, extra cookie, man, this is, this is awesome. Cindy, Cindy might be saying, you know what? Yeah, this cookie's good, but I've had amazing cookies. So as good as it is, I mean, I'm loving this cookie. It's not the best I've ever had. So I'm going to rank it a little bit lower. That being said, Cindy might actually be getting more joy from that cookie. But because Cindy's rankings from 1 to 10 or 0 to 10 for the level of happiness that she's getting is different, she's ranking it different. 
So the big outcome with this is that utility is internally consistent within John or within Cindy. They will be able to make their own rankings as to their happiness, their satisfaction from these cookies. But we cannot, we cannot make a comparison between individuals. So that is each individual would have their own utility, their own preferences, but the comparison of these preferences between individuals is not possible. That is right. We could not say that John liked that cookie more. We could not say that Cindy liked that cookie more. In the same kind of way, we could not say that, hey, John plus Cindy make up society and society got seven tenths out of six tenths total utility. Again, that would make no sense does not work. We cannot aggregate utility in that way. So just some bits to think about as we talk about this idea of utility. From this though, what we're going to do is we're going to jump over and we're going to expand on this notion of utility by taking a look at a thing that we will call an indifference curve. And the idea with an indifference curve is to say that, hey, we have utility that we obtain from every kind of good and service that we consume. So if we kind of did a pairwise comparison of two different goods, let's uh, do a pairwise comparison of, let's go like this, and we'll say that our vertical axes, let's say that these are apples, and our horizontal axes, let's say that these are oranges. Okay. Now, as we saw in the previous case, as we consume more and more and more oranges, the extra utility I get from an extra orange gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. As I consume an extra apple, extra apple, extra apple, extra apple, that extra utility gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. That is, what I could come up with is some relationship between apples and oranges such that any quantity, right? This would be quantity of apples, quantity of oranges, any quantity along here that I pick. So lots of oranges, only a few apples, or hey, kind of split my oranges and my apples evenly. No matter which one I pick along here, all of these different consumption bundles of apples and oranges will yield for me the same utility right and that's that same total utility the total happiness the total satisfaction that i receive in this case here if all of these give to me the same utility the same joy i am indifferent between any consumption bundle along this indifference curve they all make me just as happy it makes me just as happy to eat all of these oranges and just a tiny few bit of apples or all of these apples and only a tiny few bit of oranges. They all give me the same level of happiness. Now, let's just quickly clean this up. While this indifference curve shows just a constant level of utility, such that I'm indifferent between any apples or oranges along this, but what we could then have is any indifference curve that is up to the right, so let's go like this, any indifference curve up to the right, is going to represent a higher level of utility, a higher level of happiness. Well, alternatively, any indifference curve that is down to the left, down to the left there, any indifference curve down there is going to represent a lower level of utility, a lower level of happiness. So we kind of see this movement here. Along the indifference curve, same happiness, same utility. I'm indifferent. As the indifference curve moves up to the right, I get happier. As the indifference curve moves down to the left, I'm going to get sadder, not as happy. A lower level of utility being received all together. Okay, so what do these indifference curves do for us? Why, why exactly would we be interested in them? Well, the reason why we'd be interested in them is, well, we can use them to kind of compare the distributional impacts and distributional improvements between two different agents. And I say agents, economic agents, these are just gonna be people who engage in the economy. That could be you and I, this could be firms and corporations. Anybody and everybody who interacts with a market in any way is an economic agent. In this case here, 
Well, let's just take a look at two individuals. These two individuals are going to be Adam and Eve. Again, just, hey, why not? Nice, simple case. Okay. Very simple economy altogether. In this very simple economy, we have altogether 100 apples and 100 oranges. And we're going to have between Adam and Eve some initial distribution of apples and oranges. And then based off of that distribution of apples and oranges, we're going to have an indifference curve for Adam and we're going to have an indifference curve for Eve. And we could take a look at this. Let's go and draw these down. So we will have indifference curve one and indifference curve two. Okay. And what did we say? We said that the vertical was going to be our. Ah, I'm going to switch it up here. I know. I know. I'm going to mess this up from what we did last time. But I'm going to go oranges on the vertical and apples on the horizontal. And then same thing here. This will be oranges and this will be apples. And this guy here will say is Adam. And this one here is Eve. And what we'll suppose to start off, let's pick a point. Um, let's pick a point such that, let's say they both have 50 apples. Why not? They have a relatively equal share of apples. However, right, 50 and 50, that gives us our total of 100 apples. So, hey, an efficient use of apples. We're not leaving apples behind on the table. That's fully utilizing all of our apples. But for oranges, for oranges, let's say that Adam, Adam has a lot of them. That is, Adam is at 80 oranges, while Eve is only at 20. So, kind of going through this, we have 80. 50, we have a point there, we would have Adam's indifference curve. Indifference curve, Adam. Very similarly, we could go 20 and 50 right there, and we would have the indifference curve for Eve. So we'd have our two different scenarios. But, ah, but the way we've drawn this, it's really hard to compare I mean, we can take a look and go, yeah, you know what? Adam has a lot of oranges. Maybe that doesn't really seem fair, but it's really difficult to kind of compare and to see what's going on and to really determine how we could improve altogether our social distribution or our social welfare. So what we need to do in order to correct this or in order to make this comparison is we need to be able to have a way to kind of bring these two indifference curves together. And the way we can do this is by taking one of them and essentially rotating it around. So in our scenario, let's take Eve's indifference curve and let's rotate it around. And by doing so, what we're going to create is what's known as an Edgeworth box. And let's take a look at what this Edgeworth box is. So let's start off by creating, by creating a box. And so we have, uh, if I can draw a straight line, we have our vertical, we have the horizontal, and then we have the flipped axes for Eve, which is going to be the vertical and the horizontal. So we have a box as a result, keeping in mind that we had down here, zero. And what do we have for our horizontal axes? We said that these were, again, we flipped Eve. So the horizontal here would be Adam's apples. And the vertical would be Adam's oranges. Such that in each case, as we go up or as we go to the right, that is signifying more apples or more oranges for Adam, with the origin being right there in the bottom left at zero. For Eve, we'd have the same situation. Up here in the top right would be zero. And if this is Adam's oranges, well, then the vertical over here is going to be Eve's oranges. 
if this one here and here let's uh let's maybe be a little bit more clear in this let's switch colors there we go we would have eve's oranges and hey if adam's oranges are increasing as they go up eve's oranges they're going to be increasing as we go down if these guys here are adam's apples then over here we're going to have eve's apples and again, if Adam's getting more apples as we go to the right, Eve, she's going to be getting more apples as we go to the left. Okay, from here, we're going to have our initial distribution. Now, we said for this initial distribution that we had a 50-50 split of apples. So that is, we had, well, let's kind of make that a bit of a nicer line, I think. Let's go and say right there. We'll say that's about 50. It looks a little bit to the left of 50, but uh, we'll use our imagination. This was our initial distribution of apples. So Adam had 50 and Eve had 50. From here though, we also had our distribution of oranges. Now we said that Adam had a disproportionate amount of oranges. We said that Adam had 80 oranges altogether. So uh, let's uh, keep the colors constant here. There we go, something like that, such that Adam had 80 oranges and Eve, Eve only had 20. So what we see is that altogether we get our initial distribution, our initial kind of pre-distribution of apples and oranges, such that we find ourselves right here at this red dot. Okay. With our Edgeworth box then, what we want to do is represent each of these agents in difference curves, recognizing that, hey, Eve's in difference curve, or Eve's whole axis here is just rotated. So to start off with Adam, we can say that Adam's in difference curve is going to go passing through that point and then something like that, right? So from Adam's perspective, if we moved this way, that'd be lower levels of utility for Adam. If we moved this way, this would be higher levels of utility for Adam. Drawing Eve's indifference curve, well, again, going to go through this initial distribution, we would have something facing this way, right? Keep in mind, it's going to be facing, right? Being convex towards the origin, just like we had back here right back there, convex towards the origin, towards that zero point there. The only difference is it's been flipped and that's the difference there. And we now see that, hey, they both have this initial starting point. They have their points such that they would be indifferent all along here. And that is, right, they could trade amongst themselves and as long as they were along this line, they would be of no higher or no lower utility. But the really interesting part with this is that, hey, given this initial distribution, if we take a look at this, if we ended up anywhere in this little shaded green area here, anywhere in this area, that would be such a situation that, and we can just kind of go and show us, you know, just some scenario here, Eve would have some higher level of utility, Adam, would have some higher level of utility. Uh, let's see, can I make these a bit bigger so that they're a bit easier to see? There we go. There we go. There's Adam's new utility, new indifference curve. There's Eve's new indifference curve. We see in this scenario here that, hey, if we could wind up in this little green shaded area, we'll call this the lens of mutual benefit. If we can end up in this zone, we could have some new point, well, let's put it right there where it's touching both of their indifference curves at the same point in time. Well, look at this. We could get to that point, I will pretend that passes through there, and make a straight line. There we go, there we go. We could get to a point such that, like this, such that, both Adam and both Eve are going to be better off. And right, how, how are they better off? What's, what's happening for them to be better off? Well, keep in mind 
as atoms in difference curves move up to the right, so up to the right, atom is getting higher levels of utility. So in this case here, Adam is trading away oranges that Adam has a lot of for apples, which Adam doesn't have very many of, comparatively speaking. So Adam is able to increase his total utility. In the same case, Eve is able to do the same thing. As her indifference curve moves down to the left, right, essentially towards that U, towards the opening of the U, as she goes down to the left, away from her origin, her utility is increasing. And in this case here, Eve would be decreasing her apples in order to increase her oranges. In this scenario, increasing her total utility, as we see by the increasing indifference curve. Okay. That is the idea, at least, of an Edgeworth box, is that we can see, okay, based off of an initial pre-distribution, that is this initial red point right here, we had, based off of this initial pre-distribution, some point that both Adam and Eve had. And based off of this, we had an efficient pre-distribution, right? That is, it was efficient, it was there, it was on the table, Nothing was left behind. We weren't just leaving resources, leaving apples and oranges behind to rot. We had fully utilized everything. Everything was accounted for. But we see, although this pre-distribution was efficient, we were able to reallocate resources. So in this case here, Eve traded away apples to gain oranges. Adam, what did Adam do? Adam traded away oranges in order to get apples. So, okay, we have this trade going on. By doing this, we see that both of them are better off. We were able to reallocate resources such that both Adam and both Eve were better off than they were before. That is to say, while the initial situation was an efficient distribution, it was not a Pareto optimal outcome. And the reason it was not a Pareto optimal outcome is because it was possible, it was possible to have a Pareto improvement. And so let's define this. What is an a Pareto improvement? A Pareto improvement is any time that we can improve the welfare of all agents or not even all agents, if we can just improve the welfare of one agent without hurting anybody else, that in itself is a Pareto improvement. So that is the initial outcome. It was efficient, but it was not Pareto optimal. And the reason it was not Pareto optimal is that we could rechange our allocation, rechange our distribution in order to increase welfare without hurting anybody. Now, once we've rejigged everything, reworked our allocation, wound up at this new red cross, at this point here, we're now at a Pareto efficient outcome. And in this case here, we have efficiency and we have Pareto efficiency and there's no more gains to be had. And so this here is just a great way to kind of demonstrate this fact is that, hey, the initial distribution might be efficient, might or might not be fair, but irregardless of what that initial distribution is, we can rearrange, reallocate, have a Pareto improvement, and obtain a Pareto efficient outcome. All of this really just to compare and contrast it to that initial case between Bill and Ted, where the initial efficient outcome was also a Pareto efficient outcome. In this scenario here, the initial efficient outcome was not a Pareto efficient outcome. One of the big things to notice as we look at this whole Edgeworth box is that for any efficient outcome, for any initial outcome that we were to draw in here, doesn't matter where we put it, we could go and put an initial distribution, uh, let's say right there. So there we go, that's our new efficient distribution. Let's just show what that would be, something like that, something like that. 
Ah, I missed the dot a bit. Let's let's try that again. Ah, there we go. That's much better. Okay, so we have a new initial pre-distribution. Well, given this new initial pre-distribution, we would have atoms in difference curve. Uh, let's use the uh, right tool for that. Okay, we have atoms in difference curve passing through that initial point, and we would have eaves in difference curve passing through that initial point. Okay, again, we have a new initial distribution. We have where that intersects both of their indifference curves. And we see again, given the initial pre distribution, that we have room for trade. We have room to have a Pareto improvement by agreeing to sell apples for oranges or oranges for apples and arrive at a new equilibrium somewhere in the middle, somewhere in that lens of mutual benefit. And that's the big idea is that regardless of what the initial distribution is, we can trade, we can reallocate amongst ourselves and obtain Pareto improvements. Any pre-distribution will support a Pareto efficient outcome. Okay, as we've gone through all that, what exactly have we looked at in this video? Well, as we've gone through this video, really what we've done is we've defined and seen efficiency. We've seen efficiency in the case of Bill and Ted where we had, there we go, Bill and Ted, a situation where it was efficient and Pareto optimal. Because, hey, once we arrived at that initial efficient allocation, we could not change without hurting anybody. We then took a look at a case, well, we went through utility, and then we took a look at a case where we had our initial pre-distribution, but we saw that although the pre-distribution was efficient, it used all the resources at play, it was not necessarily Pareto optimal. That is, we could reallocate between us and obtain a Pareto improvement, a Pareto optimal outcome, such that everybody could be better off. In taking a look at this second kind of way with the Edgeworth box, we had to define utility and we had to define the use of an indifference curve. From here, where do we go? All of this really is just building blocks in order to have an understanding of what comes next. And that is we're going to build upon this in the next video. We're going to explore the fundamental theorem of welfare economics. And we're going to take a look at really using this welfare box or the idea of this welfare box to demonstrate, well, really this fundamental theorem of welfare economics and to take a look at really what can be done in order to have these Pareto improvements in order to maximize society's welfare altogether. If you have any questions on anything we covered in this video, again, the big idea is being efficiency, Pareto optimal outcomes, Pareto improvements, please feel free to comment below. Please feel free to send me an email. And of course, please feel free to comment on D2L as well. Thanks. Until next time.